Mate, it's, it's ages since we've it's met up It's probably a year, John. It? Where does time go? But uh, so much to talk about. Tell me, um, tell me about your, your memories of the valley and the back lake and what you think about that now in retrospect. Did you get the biggest fish out there? It was everything I needed at that point in my life. I've traveled all over the place on crazy sessions, road trips, and I just needed a bit of, I needed to go somewhere where I could genuinely unwind it is a wonderful atmosphere, isn't it? You were half expected to see a couple of milkmaids, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. <laughs> Did you get the biggest fish in there? That's what I want to know. I will never know. I experienced quite a few different recaptures, but I also lost a couple, John, that, yeah, they're sort of ingrained into to my memory. Um, how big, I don't know, but they seemed, certainly one of them, like ginormous at the time. So... Supposing I said to you, Alan, that I have another water that is exceedingly beautiful. Really? <laughs> just as beautiful as the back lake. What are we talking? No fishing club? No fishing. No okay. fishing at all. Nobody is allowed to fish it apart from me on very limited occasions. We've been restricted completely to the hours of daylight. There are some really dynamic commons in the 40s and there are some whoppers um, but i guess if i get you on there you, you'll um you'll write me into your will <laughs> that special i think it is wow i think it is Is it? Well, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> on a on a very fittingly beautiful summer morning, eh? Yeah, stunning. Isn't it gorgeous? Yeah. Got them? Yeah. Yeah. Impossible to say, but I'd say definitely they flanked and headed out that way. Oh, that's a big fish. It's bizarre. You almost get the impression that they know you've put the binoculars yeah. up and they just drop that little bit lower. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I rather fancy floaters at some stage today. I think so. I think if the weather's as I looked mm. yesterday, we'd do a lot of rain. So it'd be nice to, um, mm. yeah, have a little fix on the surface. Mm. Oh, la, 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 la. Oh, oh, um, an orange uh, one. An orange one. Wow. It's a, a two. Oh, and there's a big fish. There's a big fish next to it. There's a proper... You can just see the bow wave yeah, 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 yeah. It didn't take long to spot one. No, it didn't. I've had the great privilege of going on a number of fishing adventures with John and he never, ever disappoints. But in this instance, he has totally and utterly excelled himself. I am like a small boy. I am totally shaken. We've done a lap. We've identified a number of fish, especially up this top end of the back of the wind. They seem really content, really, really happy. And I've just got to go and get some floaters, get some bread, get a rod, and come and sit in here with John and, and put a little bit of food out. It's difficult to say quite how big some of them are, but they're big. They're really, really big. I've just seen one particular fish now with two others that, yeah, they're substantial, really substantial. And um, a bit of a gibbering mesh at the moment. Um, yeah, special, special place. Thank you. It's been a couple of years now since I pulled off the venue for Borrow Time Part One. 
Do I have any regrets? Well, you shouldn't, should you? Maybe from the viewer's point of view, they would have liked to have seen a, a big fish at the end, you know, that big lift. Like, here it is, the end of the film, that classic, how all good carp fishing films end. Here's the big urn, you know? And I never delivered that. And to be honest, looking back now, I don't even know if there was one in there. I don't know if my imagination ran away with me and I got so caught up in the moment. If I had to answer it with a yes or no, no, I don't have any regrets. But of course, like every angling situation or adventure you've been on, you always look back and think, I wonder if I'd have done that differently or for maybe giving it a bit more time or, yeah. Have you noticed it's deteriorating over the years on the surface though? Are you trickier and trickier or? Uh, we haven't done much. Okay. Um, you know, it was doing. When we first got permission to fish this, it was manic. We would do what we've just done now, and 15 carp yeah. over 30 would just go loopy, so. Nice. Too soon. Yes! <laughs> Go, Steve. Is it? Yeah. It's not the one, because he's the in one. there, but it is. Oh, man. You were never going to let this defeat Of course you. I wasn't, John. Would you? <laughs> <laughs> Would you? Uh. The moment that yeah. the moment that line comes yeah. out, kids pond. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was very. Definitely wants to get back in that Norfolk reed. He's in that Norfolk reed. How far across is he? He's right in the reed. Has he gone right in? Oh. <sighs> Little zebra mussels or something. Wow, wow, wow. The kids' pond is, uh, I suppose I brought it on myself. <laughs> the kids' pond is when you go fishing somewhere and you perhaps haven't got the minerals to deal with the job in hand, which is being a proper carp angler, fishing for proper carp, because just over your shoulder, there is the stock pond or the kids pond or the easy lake or the, the lake where you're not sticking to the assignment by going to it. This venue had a version of the kids pond. Every intention of going around with the sawn off, the floaters, had that big rainstorm come in and it's just sent them crazy, show after show, big sheets of bubbles coming up. It's really deep out there. If I'd normally have seen that, I'd have thought they were doing it up in the water and staying up, but the amount of sheeting that's coming up, they're definitely dropping all the way back down. Had to run back to the van, grab two choddies, slung the first one out there, and yeah, it is deep, big, long, bob, but then a decent crack, which is good information for tomorrow. I will take the choddies off and uh, fish with a different rig for tomorrow, but I'm gonna get another rod out there now. It's gone really carpy, like the, the, the calm after the storm kind of thing. And John's sort of gone round the other side. He set up a centre pin, knocked up a bucket of hemp with some boilies. He's round there quietly on the, on the other side watching this float. Yeah, let's get this other jolly out. I witnessed the lakes being dug 40 years ago 
Oh, they're not that old. Then. They're not that old. Oh, you look no, around and you see old. the trees. No, they're everything. beautifully well established. But I mean, I used to walk my dog around here as they were being dug 40 years ago on a night like this. Never, ever did I think I'd be sitting here on a summer evening 40 years on talking to Alan Blair about monstrous carp. So <laughs> that's life, isn't it? And you're not exaggerating so, when you say monstrous, are you? There's some very big fish in here. It's very big fish. Time. They um, just don't exist places like that. I know I said it about the previous venue, um, but this one seems in a different league. Like, <laughs> I, I, I suppose, you know, anybody of a certain certain generation who's read the stories of the past, you know, BB, Woodpool, Redmire, all these sort of places. You always dream of a private estate with a lake in it, so beautiful, so remote, so unfished. Yeah. And this has been how, how this lake has wormed into my soul, really. I just adore it. Um, I would only bring you here. That makes me feel so special. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really, really grateful. You no, know, I'm, I'm very, uh, I, I, it's a very, very special place. It really is. It was very unique. You know, I'd never fished anywhere with such strict enforcement on what you could and couldn't do. And it wasn't like your usual, no plastic baits, no floater fishing, two rods only. They, those rules weren't there. there. There was no rules for the fishing as such. No, these were very strict rules from the landowner. For example, I could only arrive at the venue at 8.30 in the morning, which meant I never got to see the venue at first light, like all carp anglers would like to. We had to be off the venue by 5.30 in the evening. You miss that great witching hour as the sun's setting and the fish starts to really become active and come alive. Along with that, we were very limited to the amount of time we could spend there, even though it was days only. We were allowed three sessions in the summer, three sessions in the autumn, and three sessions in the spring, each consisting of three days. So when the total of those nine days ended, that was it for me. It wasn't a case of, oh, I haven't really made it happen, I'll renew the ticket. That was to be the end. So in this instance, it was proper borrow time. I had to make those nine days across the three sessions really count. And if I didn't, I'd walk away with my tail between my legs. It is rapidly approaching that time that we need to leave. It feels a bit strange because she's just sort of coming into the best bit of the day really for fishing, but it is what it is. Um, I've had a really, really good day. Sadly, neither John nor I have got any carp to show for our efforts, but I feel I've already learned quite a lot. Um, I'm actually going to focus my attentions tomorrow really up the top end, uh, the first bit that you sort of approach where the fresh influx of water's coming in. I saw that big common flank on the old stanchion. Um, I saw the biggest fish I've seen so far since I've been here up that end. So yeah, greedily, that's where I'm gonna focus my attention. And it is where the bulk of the, the particle and the pellet went. However, to kickstart tomorrow morning, I am gonna come down here with John. It's an area he really likes. It's, it's got good form and he's caught plenty of big fish from here in the past. And we're just going to fish either side of the pads. John on the left, me on the right. And I've put my last couple of handfuls just the other side of these reeds here. Um, it does look really, really nice. And I can't wait to get back here tomorrow, set a float rod up and see if we can get some twitchy bites and hopefully a big sail away before setting into hopefully a really nice carp. Morning, John. How are you? Good morning, Maestro. How's it going? Slow. As you know, I have a horror for any wind with an easterly slant to it. And all right, this is a bit southerly, but it's still predominantly east. There's been no sign of a fish on the top. I had a carp probably half an hour ago bash those lilies about and then move into the reeds, just just in from my float. And so I was a bit tense about that. I'm gonna grab a bucket of particle, grab my float rod, and come and jump on the other side of these pads. Excellent, excellent. Right, see you in a second.
John and I both gave the float an hour before changing tactics. John opted in for a spot well known to him out in the middle of the lake, switching from his traditional ways to using a bite alarm. Whereas I opted to fish the far end of the lake that I baited the previous day, shipping out the bushwhack to the tree line and flicking the second rod out in the edge. Boo! I was just saying, John, I've been kind of watching them bubbling over the top of it, and then I had one single liner. I thought, it's going to go. I knew it's going to go. Any uh, idea about it? Oh, <sighs> well, it's easier than the Olympics, and I've done it's true. half a mile in 30 seconds. Oh, how exciting. Oh, I can give you a hug, there's no more social distancing. Thank you. Oh. Oh, maestro. He's I've been calling you maestro for two days. I noticed you looked at the pole as you walked past. I, 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 That's I, the device. <laughs> I make no comment. I thought the chimney sweep had been here. <laughs> <laughs> now concentrate. It's concentrate. very similar. Concentrate. Yeah. I love that sound. Yeah. It's just tremendous, isn't it? Thank you, John. Very nice. Very nice. Couldn't have happened That's to a nicer good. blow. That's good. Very, very nice. I really could not have wished for a better start. It's been somewhat of a slow day. The fish have gone to ground. Now, whether that's because of our presence yesterday or potentially there was a lot of otters around yesterday, maybe they've scared them and put them on edge, but it has come good. Got the baiting pole out, shipped it across to a, a far tree margin, which is the only arrow I think I've seen. And I say think because the chop on the water is so bad, I can't be 100% sure, but this incredible beast has probably proved me right that there are a few fish hanging around over there. Yeah, what a mega, mega creature. Really cool battle. It's so nice playing him in the deep water. Very strong fish. and. What a way to kick things off. And John was there while I was playing it. He just popped back to the motor, which made it even more special. Let's have a look at this glorious. Oh, you glorious said they were incredible carp, carp didn't you? They are lovely, and aren't they? they? Were wrong, they John. Lovely. Yeah, I've never seen him before. That's mad. No, I mean, that dorsal fin would certainly. So possibly not been caught before or, or since the day ticket era? Probably, I would guess this is a fish from the day ticket era, is my, my guess. Oh, God. Thank you. Bless you. Put a rod back out quickly and he's gone again. You know, and now I've got a second one on like, what the? Now I'm like, you made, you've made something happen. You're in, in the moment, in the zone. I've got a second fish. Up a 20, something like that, another lush common. Everything kind of aligned at that point. Like I say, the prep work was done, everything was to hand in. It was bang, new rig back on, new lead back on, shit back out, drop rig. And at this point now, I'm almost waiting for it to happen, and it happened. You know, another fish on. This time, I handed the rod to John. No, why would I have it? Teamwork. Oh man, nobody's ever done this for me. It's the least I can do, John. Anyway, I'm going to catch another one after this. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Well, how nice to feel a decent fish again after all these years. This is a cracking rod. I was going to ask you what you thought. This is a cracking rod. Massive control, isn't it? I think the length's a lot to do with it, John. There's certain situations, if it really kites now, yeah, maybe a 12 foot rod would be nice, but I feel so much more in control with those shorter rods. Wow, John. Wow, 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 wow. Well, well, well. Mwah. Good man. Well, excellent. Mmm. Mmm. I am 
so pleased with this fish. It is so good to have you here. So good to share a, a really beloved secret with a great mate. Thank you, John. And what beautiful, beautiful fish. It has been one very special afternoon. I am I was coming from Alan Blair, that's really something. Really special. No, this is, this is just brilliant. I'm so excited about this. Just a great day. We did the float yeah. fishing in the morning. We had a nice picnic for lunch. Exactly, and, and then they came on. The carp have played ball. Oh, a beautiful fish. Gorgeous fish. No, I haven't even dropped, I haven't even done anything. <laughs> this one is going some as well. This one was different. You know, he stayed deep from the off and he tanked straight up the center of the lake. This one's knocked off him. Not that I could disregard the photos I'd seen anyway, but there was some big carp in this lake and, and, and I was now attached to one. I've still got the back lead in my mouth. Uh, I just literally shipped it. Oh, I knew this was going to happen. It all happened so quickly. I never really gained anything on it, but I kept looking up to my left uh, and there was these huge overhangs that ran probably 50, 60 metres of margin. No. Take this mic off me. I'm going in. It's quite right in underneath this tree. My head's telling me that this could be a real big and this could be a special one. It's now tucked me up in the branches. All it's got to do is wrap around one big head shake. I'm going to lose it. I kind of creeped in there, pulling a few branches out of the way, watching where my Klingon leader was going, and I just see it. Big mirror. I had no idea really what I was fishing for, but it was that carp. It was that carp I wanted. I didn't know it at the time, but that's why I was there, to catch something that just makes you go, how? What a palaver. <laughs> no, that weren't a palaver. What an amazing carp. What an amazing place. It's so easy to believe that places like this just don't exist anymore. But the fact of the matter is they do. And all of this is down to John Bailey. Please come in, John. Oh, what a carp. What a moment. and it feels really good to be back, especially after yesterday afternoon. Uh, I know I said it at the time, but stumbling across or getting introduced to a place like this, it really is every angler's dream, none more so than mine. It's just paradise. It's secluded, it's quiet, it's incredibly mature, overgrown. Haven't seen a soul since we've been here. And of course the icing on the cake is the carp. Now, when John told me there was some big fish, of course I believed him, but until you really witness it yourself, you're never entirely sure. He hadn't actually sent me any photos. And yeah, the, the lake stood up to its reputation. We caught some amazing fish yesterday afternoon. And yeah, I'm back for my final day now. I had the opportunity to fish three days this summer. I had every intention, as I would in a sort of August session, running around with a, the baiting pouch and the slicker floaters, feeding riser pellet drifts, maybe catching them on bread bombs in the edge. 
but it just hasn't worked out like that. We've had these easterly winds, the fish, they're pretty much gone to ground, can't find them at all. I've already been around this morning and looked again, again, deep down wishing to catch them in those very traditional summer ways, you know, up, up in the upper layers on the surface. But I'm gonna go back to uh, exactly the same tactics as I adopted yesterday. So I'm sitting down on the teeth of the easterly wind. Um, it may well be that I'm gonna to have to ride out the entire day, much like yesterday until bite time, which was around three o'clock. But I'm more than prepared to do that. And it gives me plenty of time to make sure everything's absolutely perfect. There's no imperfections on my main line. My leaders are all perfect. Some fresh rigs are tied. And yeah, I can actually kind of chill, which sometimes in fishing is quite nice. My suspicion is that these, I mean, very few carp have gone in since the original day, uh, the original days of stocking. And my, my sense is that these are fish that are now 40, early 40s. And I think they were quite heavily fished for by some good anglers over 10, 15 years. And in my view, a big carp never forgets. You know, we, we're told by scientists that carp have a, that fish have a memory span of three seconds. I would think make that 60 or 70 years and you're nearer the mark, you know. So I guess these fish had seen the lot when they were like teenagers and now they're approaching late middle age. They're not going to give themselves up easily, but that's how I like it. After those three days in the summer, I was, yeah, my emotions were split. I'd had an incredible two hours, you know, catching some ridiculous fish. However, it also beat me up a little bit. What was really spurring me on though, what was giving me those butterflies as the weeks led on to autumn was, what if I catch another carp like that? What if there's another carp? What if there's half a dozen carp of that kind of magnitude, of that kind of size in there? What if there's an absolute giant in there? You know, those are the kind of things going through my head. That along with the fact that it was autumn, they weren't heavily pressured. Perhaps they behave more like natural carp and they'd be well up for a big feed up, ready for the winter. They were the things that were firing me up, ready to go and, you know, have round two. Yeah, I was absolutely buzzing. Well, dear Alan Blair, here we are again. What are, what are we talking about? Eight weeks on, seven weeks on? And look at it. What was your car saying? Mine was saying eight and a half degrees. Yeah, the same. It sort of <laughs> fluctuated between eight and nine. <laughs> and I'm currently in second skins, fleece line jogging bottoms, waterproof trousers, and multiple layers up here. I have got my ludicrous hat on and several layers, <clears throat> I have to admit. Um, what I don't like is the water has come up because, of course, we've had biblical rain, haven't we? And the water's come up. And um, to cap it all, we've got a, a north westerly with a bit more north in it than westerly. And that can be a, a real killer on the east coast. That does make me chuckle a little so, bit because. But otherwise, it's all great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so not the best conditions, but all I have to say that, don't they? Oh, yeah, it's not the exactly, best conditions. exactly. We're just lining ourselves up with excuses here. We've just got to, we've just got to fight our way through it. I think if you don't put some bait in and investigate up here, I might stay up here. If you did choose to do that, then I'm happy to stand with the driving wind and rain, at least for a good <laughs> oh, few hours. Well, no guilt trip there. <laughs> <laughs> at least for a good few hours, just because I... All yeah, right, I yeah, yeah. Up. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sun myself up this end. But you to, can, be, to be you, fair... You can brave the wind and the rain. If it I, wasn't just that one fish and there was... I would be going, John, can I go with it? Can I go in here? But yeah, not a lot to go well, on. Well, I mean, I'll sort of... I, I'll, absolutely fit in. I was thinking, I was actually honestly and truly thinking of just thinking, tucking myself in that bank, but I'm very happy. I'm deliriously happy, um, but I'll do anything really. Um, I mean, I'm only going to fish the one rod, very tight, usual stuff. Do you want to walk around? Yeah, let's have a let's little have look, a look down there, just let's in case look. things have changed yeah, in the last half let's have hour. a look. Take 
today, we've tipped that today, there's approximately a foot of extra water in the venue where you've obviously got the stream running through it. It's got terrible water clarity at the moment. That additional water has come from rainfall that we've had in the last couple of days, so we've chilled the water down. Yeah, autumn fishing for me, it isn't the one. You know, like I say, textbook or going back some years it was always sort of pitched as a great month to be out or a great season to be out carp fishing but i think for me i'm a lot happier personally in the spring and summer water clarity is better fish are in the edge fish are in the upper layers more fish are more active they're giving themselves away more i'm going to throw it out there and say it's probably one of my least favorite months um, at least in the winter you kind of know where you stand. You know it's going to be rock hard. You know they're going to be consolidated into really tight areas. And if you can locate them, then the fishing can be actually really, really good. Autumn's a bit of a curveball now for me in terms of, yeah, I would go as far as saying it would probably be my least favorite month to, to go fishing. It can be so, just so unpredictable. It's always a guessing game. You're trying to make the best calculated decision. There's one. There's one. That is the first show I've seen. It's right up by John. I don't know if he's seen it. Um, and it was a classic sort of a third of the way out and just slap back down, literally on the back of the wind. Like 90% of the lake's covered in wind and it was just on that wind line, <laughs> which is not good for me being completely down this other end. Although just a single show, I had to investigate it further. What else did I have to go on? It was clear I needed to move, and with the five o'clock cutoff time looming over me, I wasted no time loading the power barrow and heading back up the lake. Should be going into this part of the day, like having accrued a number of pieces of the puzzle, starting to piece them together, ready to go into a night session, Instead, you're like, just rushing. I just want to get some f***ing roots out. And the moment you start rushing, you start, I've literally just tried to sharpen a hook and I've done it in. I'm not happy with them either, for sake. I've got to tie another fresh rig now and, but yeah, I've done it now. I've sat on the tee for the wind. I've done that part of the work. It was an epic fail. It created some elimination. The issue is because no day's ever the same, I'll come back tomorrow, it'll be a totally different day. In my head, I want to write off that end now, but in the 12, 14 hours I'm not here, things can change, they could all move down there, and yeah, definitely feel up against it, don't feel relaxed. I feel a little bit better than I did down there. See where the fizz is? Come off. Wound it, mate. <sighs> There's such a good rig, like such a good rig in the right situation. And that was real lazy of me because I'm currently going through the process now of changing onto inlines, big heavy four ounce, purely because the substrate's so hard. I'm basically, I'm getting no, oh, I'm burnt. Felt good as well. I'm getting no plug on the lead, i.e. it's creating no resistance. Uh, just a pour of cold. Oh. It fell off. What do you mean it oh, fell it off? It made me feel any worse. It fell off. It, it could have been one of those things, you know. You, you are my all time carping hero. Yeah, and I've just said and to, it fell off. I just said to the camera, it was like really. Basically, I'm using a rig called a chod rig, which is phenomenal, fished over the right substrate. So it's like a helicopter setup, and the rig sort of can fly back as far as necessary. The reason it's so good is when you fish over a real soft bottom, like soft silt, the lead will disappear. I oh, sorry, but I threw it over there in the pattern. <laughs> the lead disappears into the weed or the leaf debris or the silt, and you can get away with quite light leads, but the resistance of the bottom becomes tenfold, you know? 
So it's not a bad hooking presentation. Like we were discussing earlier, there's something quite bizarre about this lake, that it's really clear and clean, and you're getting a good... Lazily, not lazily, because I'm currently going through the process of taking them off and changing them, but I thought just to, to have a rod in the water, I'll flick that choddy back out, and it's gone. I'm blaming it on that. I'm blaming it on no weight there to drive the hook in. Oh! Fell off. Fell off, John. It fell off. You don't want them to fall off, do you? Fell off. And his idea of size? They feel good, don't they? When the ones you lose are always... What was interesting, it wasn't fast. It was slow. And ploddy. Oh, they're the 50 or something. Stop it! <laughs> Last night when we left, or before we left, both Alan and I spent a quite a long time baiting up for this morning. What a glorious morning it is after the horrors of yesterday. And I didn't really talk to Alan about what he was particularly doing or what he had in mind, uh, although I guess it was pretty much like my philosophy to get get some bait in to attract them overnight, to get them used to the boilies that we're offering, and really to get them sort of like snouting around, their eyes rolling around, their senses and their taste buds and their scent uh, buds going. So I, I, I suppose really we're just trying to wake the lake up. I was talking to Alan about this particular lake we're on. And five years ago, we began to fish it just a little bit more seriously. And I would come down two or three days before fishing and bait four or five swims if I had three or four mates with me. And I'd bait a mixture of Vitalin, hemp, corn and boilies and flavorings and so on, whatever I'd got. And I would bait clockwise around the lake. And by the time I'd got back to the start, the carp would be all over the bait I'd thrown in the first two swims. They'd be bubbling, rolling, clouding. It'd be like a cauldron. Now, that went on for four years. Then suddenly, bizarrely, it stopped. It just didn't work anymore. So, you know, baiting is great. And baiting is always, to some degree, essential. But it's not always the complete answer. You've got to keep on top of it. You've got to think it through. You've got to see what the fish are doing. And you've got to keep alive, in my book, to how the water is developing. It's, it's, it's really interesting. You never want to lose them, you know, but there's certain losses that you can just bury under the carpet in, in a matter of seconds and you get back on again. But I think yesterday, one, so I'd gone through the whole low point of the day, you know, to have gleaned that one bit of knowledge and then a further bit of knowledge pushing the barrow. So two real vital bits of information that allow me to, to get a rig into the vicinity of where there was some actual fish. It's just the rough and smooth of angling, you know. You go from a low point to a high point and then you hook one and it's like, ah, oh, the greatest feeling ever. You know, Dan was with me, the cameras were rolling and yeah, for it just to come off, it's like, I never throw my rod, ever. You know, you see these videos on YouTube and, and I've, I've witnessed other anglers do it where they throw their rod down and lose their and that. I actually did kind of throw it. <laughs> Not a full blown like, or a, but I just dashed it. Just like, no man, like I just really worked hard for the bite and then it come off. For the second day in a row, the lake looked lifeless. John and I both kept active, secretly hoping that the warmer temperatures would create an opportunity on the surface. But before we knew it, it was five o'clock again and the day had passed without a single sign. Crazy. Basically, completely changing my approach today. Um, I've done two days of carp fishing, bite alarms, Ronnie Claw rigs, Slip D rigs, cultured hook baits, classic modern carp fishing techniques. But the 
fish would appear to be just super on edge, like really on edge. And I don't think it's helping by putting a rod here and a rod 10 meters down there and another rod up there and shipping the poles out and sometimes casting and catapulting boilies, all of these things. Well, as of yet, they haven't worked. The only bite I had was on a choddy, which was a single cast with no free food around it. I'm almost getting to the point that I think they're scared of food. The mix today is a lot more bitty and I'm only going to be putting in very, very small amounts. Reflecting back on the last session, I was fishing with a single tiger with a bit of corn on top and then just a tiny handful of bait. And I think with the depth of the water, the dispersion of that bait, I was basically fishing a single hook bait. So today's going to be sort of single hook bait fishing or at very best, just a very light scattering of bait because I think they're scared of food. And also incorporating float. I am going to go around today and just look for opportunities. If we get that beautiful sunshine again, I have got some bread and I will try and see if I can get an opportunity on the top. But got to make every second count today. It sounds a bit like I am bigging Mr. Blair up, which uh, I suppose I am in a way. But one of the reasons I like fishing with him is that uh, on a couple of days like this, which has been hard, you know, um, he accepts that he it makes him it motivates him it drives him to fish harder to think more deeply and so on and i like that i think you have if you if you want serious and interesting and rare and difficult fish you have to sort of come to terms with failure i i, I guess the toughest thing i ever did was when i set my heart on catching a Ferox trout from Scotland. Now, Ferox trout, in case you don't know, a great big predatorial brown trout. And um, I began fishing for them in 1976. And of course, it was a 400 mile, 500 mile journey north, 500 miles back. Huge effort went into this. And I finally caught my first Ferox trout in 1990. So it took me 16, sorry, 14 years to catch one. And as I say, going back to the start of this little piece, that's what I like about Alan, because he knows that some things can't be caught easily and you've really got to commit to catching them if you're going to do that at all. I'm sorry, I'm just, just slightly distracted because I'm sure something's going on down there. That's the beauty of a float if you've got a big fish in the swim. You think about a 30, 40, 50 pound carp down there, the turbulence it's creating. That float has definitely just taken on an uneasy sort of aspect to it. So I'm, uh, I've lost interest in ferox trout and I'm back trying to catch an enormous big carp. Could happen. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't very disappointed at the moment. Kind of got up this morning, new plan, uh, and that was to really stay on my toes. You know, I'm pretty good at getting around the lake, looking for the fish, setting traps, and if they don't work out, moving on to another opportunity. And I thought I'd really refine that tactic today by literally just fishing two rods. Um, one of them I never really even used. One was the float rod. And yeah, I've been round, tried to fish for bubblers, not really found any bubblers. My first lure in this morning, I booked a pike. I should have known at that point it was going to be a, a pretty dreadful day. Yeah, I feel really deflated. Um, probably more so because I've tried so hard. If I'd have just sort of slung them out and maybe crashed out and had a few hours sleep or maybe not been so particular with my baiting or my rigs, then I'd probably be thinking to myself, well, I could have tried harder, but I don't feel I can. Um, they've just been elusive. I kind of got really lucky last time to catch those fish in such quick succession. Blanked either day either side, and I suppose I'm finally now, after two visits, come around to the realisation that 
and it's not easy. When we first discussed coming and, and doing a few trips down here, I was literally living in this fantasy land, you know, very unpressured fish uh, in, in absolute paradise, thinking, yeah, I'll really, I'll really do some damage basically. And I've, I've properly had my ass kicked. My final session on this incredible place will be in the spring now. And as much as I'm gonna go away today, disappointed, I suppose there's always that to really look forward to. Some good weather, the fish waking up again after that sort of winter slumber, and hopefully a few more opportunities to try and catch some of these special carp. The problem is, it's, and I am the most guilty of it, it's so easy to get sucked into hours and hours and hours of running around with a saw and off, because you can see one, and then they go, and then you move somewhere else, then you see some more. I need to think like a proper carp angler. What would a real carp angler, what would a real carp angler do in this situation? And I'm gonna get some bait in. Get some bait in now. The tree line dummy bites back in the summer. I think if I put the pole up now, put some bait out, and I'm gonna go right across here as well. They, they, they love it here. They love it here in every lake. There's always one, two, three areas that they love over everywhere else. And this is one of them, whether it's their absolute favorite, I don't know, but I can just see a whole day disappearing in the valley, like running around like a headless chicken, achieving nothing, catching nothing. Whereas I want to get some bait in. Because this is the last session, rather than being that opportunist, just fishing for that one bite at a time. Well, I'll go get another one now. I'll go and hit another one. I want to hit. <laughs> I need to go out with a bag. I was starting to really doubt one, how many's in here. Of course, there's the ongoing doubt of have they been ordered. And I can comfortably say that whatever the stock is, because I haven't seen the entire stock, but I've seen enough in. 45 minutes to go There's some seriously mega carp in here. <laughs> Spring is it's just magical and everything is exploding with life. You look around here, you know there are pheasant chicks all over the place, there's, the leaves are coming out, the swallows have arrived. You youngsters, anyway, it's just so lucky now that you can fish lakes in April and May because it's, it's just simply the best time. April and May see the same, the, the, the first real warms. April and May see longer hours of daylight than dark, which is important. I mean, there are older flies hatching all over the place now, and that's great. That's, that's sort of getting the water ticking over, it's beginning to get silver fish moving, bigger fish like carp and tench moving. What more can I say? It's just absolute bliss. Nothing, it's in the trees. Huh? It's stuck in the trees, bruv. God, I was lucky there, man. That was in the trees, like actually locked up in the branches. It's those kind of situations where uh, you really need to believe in your gear. But a funny old half hour, I had a jack pike, a really weird drop back. And now a carp. It's not a giant, I've seen him. But if it's anything like that evening or that afternoon in here before, there might well be another bite on the cards. Oh, he's not that small. Scaly one, big linear, ridiculous. Absolutely, heart's just gone. Oh, mate. Wow. Wow. Oh. 
you can't talk either. As I was playing that, I was saying like, you know, you're all about your gears up for the job and that. And I thought, don't say that. We watched a clip of John Wilson here. <laughs> and I was thinking, dang, I'm going to look. Oh my God, bruv. Look, just put the camera down. the camera off. <laughs> That is one hell of a creature. I actually thought it was a small common to start with. Um, and then I saw it twisting in the water, the scales. Oh man. Yeah, these are the really, really special ones. Special place. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, here we are again. Day two, a slightly different day, a bit more wind coming right down the lake, which I suppose normally in carp fishing circles you'd say is a good thing. I'm quite happy with that. I think we've sort of isolated that there is a pod of fish that uses a big fallen tree just down there to my right. And they obviously spend a lot of time in that and they, they come out, they do a little bit of a tour down this bottom end of the lake, have a grub around, and then go back to sort of rest up in there. So last night, with this in mind, I put probably about a kilo of hemp and corn in along this piece. My hope is that they will, I put a bit more in today, my hope is that they will come out of that forest that jungle there and just work along this ledge which is what they tend to do they work along here and then go out probably as far as that second willow and round and that's what they do so the idea is just to ambush them as they come out of there I mean it's tempting to put a bait right flat bang on the fringe there but I've done that and uh, these are very very big fish and they know exactly where sanctuary is and I can't see any point in just putting a hook in a fish to lose it 10 seconds later. It's just not right. Well, my confidence was not misplaced. Within 15 minutes, I'd had this very sweet little female tench. Look at that beaut. Look at her. Isn't she a cutie? Perfect condition, apart from a slightly otter dorsal fin going back in time and obviously a cormorant scar at some stage. But she hasn't spawned, she's coming up to it at some stage. Three and three quarter pounds, I guess, of absolute tinker delight. I'll just slide her back. You know, so... I never really thought I'd say this, but when I was a kid, sort of 9, 10, 11, 12, all I lived for was tench. It was just like tench, tench, tench. And then I got to 12, 13, and it was all carp, 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 till I got to, say, 40. And the last 20 odd years, I'm just loving tench again. It's just funny how the, the circle goes round. I mean, obviously, I prefer a 40 pound common to that, that little girl, but only just. I'm really chuffed. At the kids' pond at this place, it's like the kids' pond everywhere. You have to put it into perspective. I was very aware, you know, I'd be watching these fish. There wasn't the potential big ones like there was in, in the main lake, but it still interested me. You know, it was a different venue. There was lots of reeds. There was, again, water coming in. It just, I was just drawn to it, you know, probably because I could see them a little bit better. The water clarity was better. It was a smaller lake, which you always felt that little bit closer to them. Yes, there was an element of I wanted to prove them wrong, but there was also a bigger element of that lake's got some real mega carp in it. Why would this one not too? Yes. <laughs> Ridiculous mirror. 
I couldn't help myself. I thought I'd have one more go on what, he, what we've named the Kiddies Pond. It absolutely is, and it's an incredible lake with some mega fish inside. This has been a prime example of that. Yeah, they were basically sitting underneath the sort of the dead reeds on the surface, um, attached a bread bomb, size four claw, teased in position, bounced it over a couple of reed stems. Yeah, this was the pick of the bunch without a doubt. What an incredible carp. I carried on pursuing the kids pond dream and I proved them wrong and probably caught one of the best carp I've ever caught. If you want to play the old, oh, look how ancient this one is you ain't getting much better than this. You know, this is like prehistoric stuff. This is, he's been ottered countless times. He's fought back, he beat the otters. He's gone through decades of ice over his head and he's still there. And yeah, that was, that's one I'll never forget that carp. I'm telling you now, you just don't know what is on the end, do you? <laughs> you know, like you go so. Yeah, not a small one, man. It's right over by that tree. Mate. I think I should follow this up. right up on the top man seen it don't no it's not big mate <laughs> oh my god it is really small as well isn't it One more gift, one more gift. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I've got to be careful because I don't want to make it sound like complete hero worship. But I love fishing with Alan and obviously I've fished with Alan for quite a number of years now in different situations. And I, I think it's massive, this ability to conjure a fish out of virtually nowhere sometimes. And he's also got the ability, not only that, he's also got the ability, I think, to see when there's a real window opening and really profiting and really pushing that window open to its fullest degree. Now, it, it, it's interesting and it, 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 it's lovely to watch because I think he takes it he takes it to another level in many ways. I think the first angler that I, I would compare him very, very much with John Wilson in his early days. When I fished with John, it was absolutely full throttle, naught to 60, really, really going for it. And I, I see a lot of John in Alan's approach and it's that positivity, it's that forcing things to work. And it's, it, it's nice and I mean, I, I've seen Alan catch some really, really, really lovely fish in these sessions and I'm just delighted for him and th there is absolutely nothing in me that wishes, oh my God, I wish I'd caught that fish or whatever. And, and it's really nice, you know, it's like a monkey you get off your back as you get older. It's just lovely to be in a beautiful place with a very fine angler, seeing some tremendous fish. I've got a couple of the rods out. I'm going to position another two along this bank, uh, try and spread them out a little bit more today, uh, purely because they, these fish do not like being hemmed in. They really don't. Uh, even using back leads, I get the impression they know they're being fished for. Um, 
John's headed down to the bottom tree. He's only actually here for a couple of hours, um, up until about one o'clock, uh, and then he's got a head off. Uh, and that's really the end of it for, for us fishing here. To be fair, we, we should have just gone yesterday, but the boys needed to get some shots, and I kind of did one, one last roll of the dice. So yeah, he's gonna head off home. I'm gonna ride it right out until five when we have to leave. You never know. You just never know. It's thrown so many amazing surprises up. Um, yeah, it's gotta be worth a few more hours this afternoon. I could see this lake being fished, you know, two days a year in the future. Perhaps one, perhaps none, you know. It's a magical place, it's a very secretive place. I'd half like it just to sort of, just slowly sort of disappear back into the tranquility of the woods and the fish just carry on this serene, untroubled lifestyle of theirs. So I don't think I'll be, I think after this, I think there'll be a lot of peace for them, I guess. nervous at the moment. It's a choddy. I'm not fishing it drop off. Far from ideal. And John's standing next to me <laughs> and he's a legend and it makes me nervous. <laughs> it's also blowing bubbles which is usually a sign of a good one. It's a to totally different fight to that common. I'm going to take that as the best possible ending I can imagine. I couldn't have wished for any more. I've really enjoyed the summer, the autumn, and most importantly, this spring session. The most ridiculous fight. Look at it, it's an absolute creature. Super powerful. And yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. Loved every minute of it. I'm going to be super grateful for the lovely times. And yeah, end the chapter here. But best of all, John and I have got one more adventure planned. What an opportunity, what a place, what ridiculous carp.